I wanted to do this broadcast to clear up some possible misconceptions people have on what angels are and uh, the role of angels in God's kingdom. And we see here in Hebrews 1 verse 14, it says, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Let's just think about that for a little bit. A lot of us think of angels, or I mean a lot of people, I mean, think of angels as like these little things with wings, these little, like, that look like cute little babies flying around shooting little arrows, you know. That's, that's what Hallmark has done with that concept. But we see that's not the way Bible, the Bible describes angelic beings. Actually, angels are spiritual beings. They are spirits, in essence, that are assigned to do certain tasks that God created them to do. Now, we could ask, why would God need angels to perform any of his tasks? Well, we could also say the same thing. Why would a king need servants? Why would a king need subjects that do his bidding? Well, it's not that a king would need that, that and neither God doesn't need us or angels or anything he has created to accomplish his purpose. He can do anything he absolutely wants to. And that's a misconception that people sometimes get in their minds, even if they are claim to be Christians and are in Christian circles, they think, well, God needs us or God needs his angels, or, well, that's not true. God does not need anything from us. Uh, in the book of Acts, it says he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything from us. And the same is true with uh, angels. He does not need them, but he created them for a purpose that he alone knows why he did that. And so sometimes we get misconceptions about certain biblical words like angels and demons in the Bible, and a lot of people get a lot of misunderstanding about what demons are, too. A lot of people think that they're just these spooky, scary <clears throat> creatures that, like, horned, menacing, ugly, and stuff like that, but basically what demons are and what the devil is are angels that have rebelled against God and have been cast to the earth. A lot of people think that the devil is in hell right now. And that is just erroneous. It's not true because the devil is very active. In 1 Peter it says, For your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he might devour. Now, if the Satan was already down in hell, he would not be able to prowl around seeking for people to devour and deceive. And so that's that's one that's those are just a few misconceptions people have. But like, also I want to address the very important uh, thing about this matter is there's a lot of misunderstanding that goes along with these spiritual matters. That you know God hasn't revealed everything to us about the spiritual world, but He's revealed enough through His Word that we can get an idea of what is going on. There's a spiritual battle. It goes on all around us all the time. We might not be aware of it, we might not sense it, but it's going on. And it's over mostly, the fundamental thing it is over is the souls of people. The souls of people God wants to save, but the, but the devil wants to deceive and destroy. Jesus talked about Satan in this way. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. So we see the agency of demons and the devil is obviously not a good one. We see that, you know, Satan isn't always going to appear as something menacing and dark and scary and neither are demons. Because it says uh, in, in Corinthians, I believe it is 2 Corinthians, where it says Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Meaning his work is deception. His work is not to scare people predominantly, but to actually deceive them into buying the lie. And if he can get people to buy the lie, he can get them to join him in hell. And so the whole point is, as Christians, we are called to share the gospel. And some people will respond to it. Some people will not. But, you know, the deceiver works very hard to keep people blinded to that truth. And, you know, if we take a look at 2 Corinthians, let me just turn there real quick. 
it refers to this matter. Let me turn it, let's see. Let's see, I'm gonna find it real quick. But it actually says, for the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Now, who is it talking about there? It is talking about Satan and demons. The God of this age has blinded the eyes of unbelievers. Meaning it's not calling Satan, it's not putting Satan as equal with God, but it's saying that his influence over the minds of people makes him like the God of this age, which is, it's spelled with a lower G when you read it in the scripture. But it's basically, he is, as what Ephesians says, the spirit that is work in the, at work in those who are disobedient. Let's read that passage real quick, get an idea of what's going on here. And the whole power behind that deception is, at the root of it, our own sinful hearts. If we were not sinners, we would not so easily be deceived as we are. But by nature, we are sinners. And we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we are all, as scripture says, under the control of the devil. And we will go to that passage after we examine this one, where it says, uh, let's see. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and your sins in the way in which you used to live. When you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So it refers to the devil, the actual devil, as the spirit that is at work in those who are disobedient. So basically, Satan is a spiritual being that works in and among the unbelieving, the rebellious, and the people who are blinded to their sins and do not know Christ. And so, if we turn to 1 John, we will see what it says about this being called the devil. We'll turn to 1 John. And there's a lot of misunderstandings. There's a lot of suspicions. There's a lot of, a lot of times one of the temptations of people is to come up with all these ideas that are not necessarily spelled out right in scripture. We, I mean, there's a lot we don't know about the supernatural and the spiritual world. So what people oftentimes do sometimes is they let their imagination fill in the details that they don't know. And that's what we're trying to avoid. Uh, First John talks about, let's see, let's take a look. Let me find this. Let me find this. Because it talks about the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. And so, let's see, but Jesus Christ came to destroy the devil's work. Let's see. Okay, and so... Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness, but you know that he appeared so that he may take away our sins, and in him is no sin. So talking about Jesus Christ coming, and no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen or known him. So it's like before we get saved and come to know Jesus Christ, the, the pattern of our lives will be sin and rebellion and that's we're not by nature good or inclined towards the law of God we're not inclined to obeying God or doing what pleases God and uh, let's see okay so so it's it talks about you know that there and then it goes on to say Let's just take a look here. This is how we know who the children of God are and who are the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister. And so it's saying disobedience, a pattern of continual disobedience and sin is a mark of being under the control of devil, under the control of the devil, I mean, it actually is 
it may sound a little harsh here. It even says, you know, that person is a child of the devil. Someone who makes a practice of continually sinning, it says, is not a child of God, but a child of the devil. And so that's by nature what we are apart from Jesus Christ. Until we turn from our sins and repent of our wickedness and our life of rebellion and sin against holy God, we are under the control of the devil and he can basically move us to do whatever he wants. And our sinful nature gets us into enough trouble on its own. And so it's not to say that the devil is always making people sin or do this or that. You know, hey, we can all get into enough trouble just because there's sin in our hearts. And what Jesus Christ does is he comes and he washes away our sins and he gives us a new heart. And that's what I want to look at. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. That means when Christ enters our life, he transforms us from the inside. And that works its way to the outside. And so, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. God takes us from the dominion of darkness and transfers us to the dominion of his son. That means we come under new management. Jesus Christ is now our Lord and Savior. We, call, we go by his shots. And just as, just as the angels, the, the ones that are good, that do the will of God, are God's servants, so too we become servants of God, the living God. We become, through the adoption, through the Lord Jesus Christ, we become children of God, but we also become servants of the living God. That means our life should be aimed towards serving him and doing what pleases him. So therefore we are servants, but we are also adopted children of God, as it talks about in scripture too. In Romans 8, it talks about we've received adoption through Jesus Christ, meaning we we, we go from being under the per parental control of the devil, basically, to becoming adopted out of that darkness into his marvelous light. Let's take a look at what Romans 8 says. Just real quick, we'll turn to it. And so, I'm kind of getting off on a tangent here, but I think it's worthwhile and necessary information we must grasp. Uh, Romans 8 talks about, let's see. Ah, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to become a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, meaning we will still die, we'll still physically die because sin. That's when, when death first entered the world, it was when Adam and Eve chose to sin against God and therefore they lost their immortal privilege. So, and it says, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh, to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Meaning if we live according to the sinful nature, if we live for sin, we will certainly die both physically and spiritually, eternally. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God, those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. 
The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so you uh, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit if the spirit oh, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received bought, brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. And so that's basically, and well, I think I'll read the next verse. It says, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And that means when we are converted, when we turn away from sin and we embrace Jesus Christ and we believe the gospel message, that means we receive that adoption into God's kingdom. We are no longer children of the devil. We go from being children of the devil, ruled by sin and Satan, and we become children of God. that make our the goal of our lives to live for Jesus Christ and please him. And there's a transformation in our heart that takes place that makes that possible. But, you know, I know the original purpose of this message was to clarify some misconceptions we have about angels, but I think we'll get back to that matter. Uh, a lot of people don't understand uh, what the role of an angel is. But, you know, and there's some things that the scripture does not tell us, but we know that there is spiritual warfare that goes on around us, and there are good angels, and then there are fallen angels, which are demons and Satan himself. And so, you know, there is conflict between those forces that, that is going on behind the scenes that we don't really see. But what's the most important thing to focus on is Jesus Christ. We're not called to just merely focus on the things we don't know. We are called to read the word, study it, and learn about the things that God has revealed to us. As it says in Deuteronomy, I believe it is Deuteronomy, the, the secret things belong to God, but the revealed things belong to us. And so if we have any kind of question about anything, we ought to search the scriptures and become well acquainted and understand what the word of God says so that we're not forced to come up with our own ideas as to what is what or this or that or the other. You know, we are told everything we need to know in this book and the stuff that God does not tell us is not important for us to know. It's like it, when you're a child, your parents told you what you needed to know that was very essential for any particular period of life that you were in. Like there were some things that they would reveal to you and share with you as a child, but they would withhold some information from you at certain ages, and then when you got a little older, they would reveal more. But there are some things that God just won't explain to us in this life, and so it's, it's, it's for our good that we just learn what we can know about God and what we can know about spiritual realities through the Word of God and not try to come up with our own imaginative ideas to make hypothesis about this or theories about that, you know, when we're not really actually told this or that. We're just told what the book tells us. God bless.